Let's talk about Indigenous literacy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Heiser Says. Now, a few days ago, we had Australia Day, and I did a video about Australia Day, and the people that were calling for things like changing the date or calling it Survivor Day or Invasion Day or trying to leverage a change.org petition into a business to get a flag on a bridge. When a lot of these things, I think, are frankly pointless and meaningless in a practical changing people's lives effort. I think it's all just tokenistic, you know, virtue signaling on a grand scale. And I thought I'd look at literacy rates because it is proven, demonstrable, that there is a link between functional illiteracy and jail or criminality. There's a high proportion of people in prisons who are functionally illiterate, and that data hasn't changed in 30 years. And we have a population here that's overrepresented in our justice system in, in prisons. But, you know, the, the people are talking about dismantling it or throwing more money at these things, but they're not talking about another issue, or not enough, which is the literacy rate. And that should be discussed on Australia Day, that we've got a large portion of our citizens that are still functionally illiterate in the 21st century and how that will affect the ability of their children, their children's children. You know, that is, you know, the passing on of debt, the passing on of inability to function efficiently or even partake in our modern civilization. Literacy, it's a simple bloody thing. And that should be what people are doing change.org petitions about, not putting a flag up on somewhere because that will actually change people's lives. So let's have a look at some of the figures here. So I got this from uh, Creative Spirits. So literacy rates among Aboriginal students are lowest in remote communities. Reasons include low literacy of the parents, okay, poor school attendance. So a lot of a lot of people don't realize that it's uh, parents have a huge role in helping their children learn to read, particularly in the early years when you read to your children. Initiatives like the Accelerated Literacy Program try to bring literacy to a similar level to that of non-Aboriginal peers. So here's some of the statistics that, um, hang on, I'll zoom in to make sure you can see it a bit better. There we go. So 18%, the percentage of Aboriginal students who failed to reach the national minimum of reading and writing standard in 2015. Percentage of non-Aboriginals, 6%. So they're three times... Uh, three times as many or percent-wise percent wise relative to non-Aboriginal students not meeting these national minimum. Percent of Aboriginal students in the Northern Territory who achieve below the national minimum standard in numeracy in 2015. That's insane. And this is only, what, four years ago, three years ago? Who achieved below the national minimum standard in spelling, grammar, and punctuation, 61%. 61%. 46%, the percent of Aboriginal adults, adults in Australia who are functionally illiterate. Functionally illiterate. And in remote areas, remote communities, it can be up to 70%. Okay? So you've got all bunch of lefties and, and social justice warriors and you know and the, you know investing billions of dollars in these remote communities to try and help these people. Okay? Now, have you ever dealt with a government bureaucracy, a program? You know, I, I had to get my, my dad money for two weeks. I had to go to a Centrelink. I had to fill out all these forms to do all these online things. Now, okay, for me, that's no problem. But even for my mother, just trying to fill out a form online is a bit harder and it's a bit of a pain. So she'll go and do it by paper. So in some ways, her literacy level with technology isn't as high as the average person or the younger people nowadays. But could you imagine if you couldn't even read the form? How much trouble are you going to have filling it out? We saw also with the Royal Commission where there were insurance companies ringing up and credit card companies ringing up people in remote communities selling them products like death insurance for their funerals. And... You know, they were signing up for it and then they were ringing up later to try and cash it in. They didn't understand what they were signing for. So you get people trapped and taken advantage of in many ways because they can't read. 
Look at that, 46%, 70% in these remote areas. That is insane. That is insane. You know, putting a flag up on a on the Sydney, you know, Sydney Harbour Bridge or putting a, you know, going to a, a Survivor Day protest with your white greeny friends. It may make you feel good. It may make you feel like you're doing something. But while this number is still so high, it is absolutely pointless, meaningless, and it's just tokenistic social justice, you know, arrogance, really. Let's have it keep going. So 79%, the percent of Aboriginal students at or above the national minimum standard in year three reading and numeracy in 2015. So that's, that's you know, 80%. It's better than it could be. Non-Aboriginals is 95%, 95.5. Remember, Australia is a country that's meant to have 99% literacy rate. When you've got half of Aboriginals, which make up about 3%, not being functionally illiterate, more than half, that's or nearly half, that's concerning. So 83% per percent of Aboriginal students at or above the national minimum standard in year 9 compared to 96%. So they're getting better. It's improving, hopefully. But still, that's a big difference. And literacy, just being able to read, write, do math, simple things, is really important. You know, I, I shouldn't even have to say that. So let's have a look at that a bit more. So... Aboriginal literacy rate rates, sorry, I can't read. Aboriginal literacy rates are low. Now, when we talk about literacy, we assume we mean literacy of the written word. Bear in mind, though, that many Aboriginal people are masters of oral literacy. Yes, I, I appreciate that, but the problem with that is that's not going to help you deal with the bureaucracy. It's not going to help you deal with, with all the forms and paperwork and stuff you have to set up. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, nearly half of Australia's population lacks minimum literacy skills. The literacy rate gap between Aboriginal students and non-Aboriginal students is large and persistent and varies greatly depending on remoteness. Yep. Across Australia, okay, we've read all of these statistics that have gone through here. And this shows you where Aboriginal students in remote areas failing national literacy standards, numeracy, failing, wow, reading, writing. Long-term trends show no overall national improvement in Year 5 reading between 2008 and 2015. No improvement. None. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? All It's not working. What they're doing isn't working. But Year 5 Aboriginal students have improved. The same trend was clear for Year 7. At Year 9, the national reading achievement has been stabilized, including for Aboriginal students. There was no change in mean numeracy achievements for year three Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal students between 2008 and 2015. Test score gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal are narrowest in the early years. A study of preschoolers found the gap was about one year. So a five-year-old Aboriginal student performed at the same level as a non-Aboriginal of four years. By the time children are in late primary and early secondary school, the gap has widened to two years. Less than 30% of children tested for literacy in year 3, 5, and 7 were able to read or write properly, leaving them with numeracy and literacy skills of 5-year-olds when they leave school. The National Report on Schooling in Australia 2005 also found falling literacy rate rates the longer children stay in school. The number of children who met the Australian reading benchmarks dropped from 78% in year 3, uh, to 63.8%. In year 7, numeracy numbers fell from 80.4 80, 80 to 40 point in year 3 to 40.8 in year 7. Wow. Look at that drop. So when the students went from there to there, from that, from that year to that year, look at that drop. Wow. The fact that the gap widens over time and suggests improving school quality for Aboriginal people can help close the gap. Huh? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The fact that the gap widened over time suggests that the school system that is currently in place is failing them. It doesn't necessarily suggest improving it will adjust it. I, I, I've got very little confidence in our current schooling system. I don't think it's set up for the 21st century. I don't think it's set up for these remote communities either. I think there has to be a smarter way to approach it, a more innovative way to approach it. 
Low literacy prevents Aboriginal students from entering higher education universities and leads to poorer health, lower self-confidence and alcohol abuse. Yeah, I can agree with that. They should also say criminality. Increased chance of criminality. Adult, adult literacy rates can be equally low. About 40% of Aboriginal adults have low literacy across Australia, a figure which can be as high as 70% in, in um, remote areas. So let's have a look. Why are they so low? The reason for low Aboriginal literacy rates are complex and affect both juvenile and adult learners. Parents know little. Parents often left school without basic literacy and numeracy skills, providing the children with a low literacy home environment. That is just not just a problem for Aboriginal communities. That's a problem with any community where the parents are low literacy. It, it affects the children. If they were raised in missions. It was very likely they weren't educated because they weren't expected to learn to, learn to read and write. See, I... I I'm surprised at that. I, I want to do a bit more digging into that because I thought the missions would be kind of forcing them to read the Bible. Anyway, that's just my ignorance. These people struggle to support their children and form a cycle of literacy. Yes, that you can see that happening. Inappropriate learning environment. A Western learning setup may not be suitable to teach Aboriginal people. I think it, a Western, the current Western learning environment isn't suitable to teach most people, to be honest. It's suitable to teach factory workers in the 19th century, but not now. Learning programs can be very successful with educators from the local community who are aware of what happens outside the classroom, which influences learners. Trauma and mistrust. Trauma from a history of stall and generations left some parents deeply suspicious of Western institutions, including schools, and they simply refused to enroll their children. Yeah, I can completely appreciate that perspective. I want to go to school, but my parents told me, no, they might take you away for good. And they ran away in the bush. Yeah, I can understand that. You love your kids. You don't want to lose them. You've seen it happen before. You may have been taken away. Yeah. Children not enrolled. In 2008, about 20% of compulsory school age Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory sorry, in the Northern Territory, were not enrolled in school. And many of those enrolled did not attend school regularly. Too shy to attend school. Especially older Aboriginal people are often too shy or embarrassed to go back to school. Often after they watch their peers go, some might join themselves. Yeah, we can all relate to that. If you want to learn a skill and uh, you're too old, perhaps, to do it, it may be embarrassing to go there. Now, that's why, I, I mean, I love mobile phones. You can learn any... I, I was watching all these videos on welding. Never done it in my life. To, to learn how terrible I am at welding, but, you know, you can learn these skills. But to do that, I need to have basic literacy, basic basic numeracy, computer skills, and access to this technology. If you don't have any of that, it's, it's going to be a nightmare. Bear in mind that for every student in class, the reason for literacy can be different. Some might enjoy school but have issues at home that affect their ability to learn. Others might have good homes but no attention span. So, Australia's system, yep. So Australia's system of public education can never be called a success until Aboriginal Australians benefit from it as much as any other citizens. Well, I think a lot of citizens don't benefit from it regardless, but yeah, the Aboriginals are copping it. If, if you've got such low literacy levels in the 21st century in a first world country for a portion of our population, guys, what, what do you expect is going to happen? You know? What do you expect is going to happen? You're, they're just going to... The more money you throw at these remote communities, if people can't even read or write... It's not going to make any difference. Okay. Low literacy does not mean inability. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is pretty much going how they can actually count without it. So it just shows an Aboriginal literacy program. So specific programs aim to improve Aboriginal student literacy levels. The Literacy for Life Foundation is an Abor Aboriginal run charity that uses UNESCO approved Cuban developed model designed for disadvantaged communities. It, it trains local people to deliver literacy classes to their communities. So I thought we'd have a look at this one here, the, in, the Indigenous Literacy Foundation launched in 2009. The ILF works to provide access to books and literacy resources to over 200 remote Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory, Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia and New South Wales. The foundation aims to build cultural literacy, connecting people, particularly young, to their culture and traditional language, practical literacy, developing the skills needed for daily activities, and English literacy, promoting skills in English reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So let's have a look at it here. This is this is them. So, oh, 
Wait, make sure you can see all of that. Yep. We are a national book industry charity to reduce the disadvantage experienced by children in remote indigenous communities across Australia by literacy level and instilling instilling a lifelong love of reading. We do this through our three core programs. So I've got book supply, book bars, and community literacy programs, our uh, projects. They want to close the literacy gap. So 280 remote communities, that's how many books they've supplied. And if if you want to help, you know, if you're hearing this and going, oh, you know, what can I do? I'm, you know, an inner city Greens voter. Florian, you're just a racist by bringing this up. Uh, maybe donate. Maybe give them some money. Buy some books. Or if you're, you know, one of those crazy, you know, alt-right centrists who believe everyone, you know, equal <laughs> and equal... Um, Opportunity society means that there are inherent differences in people's abilities, but you know, you feel like a bit of your own personal charity will go to something good. This is maybe something to look at. So let's look at about it. So, we'll, uh, so it was founded by teacher Susie Wilson, the owner of Riverbend Books in Belimba, Brisbane. So a local got the ball roll rolling in 2004 when she launched the Riverbend Readers Challenge to raise money to boost literacy levels. The challenge grew and then teamed up with the Fred Hellows Foundation and the Australian Book Industry to become the Indigenous, Indigenous Literacy Project in 2007. In 2011, it was superseded by the Indigenous Literacy Foundation, a national not-for-profit charity focused on improving literacy levels in very remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So... What do they do? What do they do? So, yeah, we'll zoom in here. Being able to read opens so many doors. But in very remote indigenous communities, books are all too scarce. Literacy levels are so much lower than anywhere else in Australia. Our proposal is to make a difference to the levels of indigenous families by not only gifting thousands of new culturally appropriate books, pardon me, with a focus on early literacy and first language, but also by running programs to inspire the communities to tell and publish their own stories. So, wow, that almost sounds like they're trying to get get these local communities maybe to establish businesses or to get work out there. Oh, boy, we can't have that. Don't let the Greens see you doing that. They won't like that, particularly if they start making too much money and improving themselves. So we work in over 280 remote communities here. So you can have a look. So book supply, book buzz. So, the, the, yeah, the general locations of the community. So, have a look at where they're all working, how far and remote they are. So, here's Brisbane. Okay, guys, remember, this is the size of Europe for Europeans watching here from one side to the other. You know, I think what we drove from Melbourne to Brisbane took us a couple of days. Um, so, yeah, Australia is a big continent and some of these communities are really remote, really remote. So, guys, let me know what you think. Do you think, you know, are these organizations the way to go? Should the government keep uh, chucking money at it? What ideas would you have to improve literacy levels in these remote communities? Uh, it encourages me to, to see programs like this, you know, from a teacher in a bookshop has grown into something so big. And I can see this as actually having a legacy and having an improvement on these people. Not the bloody protesters. Guys, if you ever actually manage to watch this, which I probably doubt you would, you're just showing off to your friends. You're not really making a difference doing that. Anyway, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you all again next time. Bye for now.